Oh, this is the 15th chapter in Lillian Gask's The White Nile, Quest for the White Nile. Chapter the 15th, The Advice of the Great Horned Owl. One calm still evening, when scarcely a rustle stirred the leaves, and the moonlight lay on the earth like a flood of silver, Conrad reached the home of the Great Horned Owl. The mighty forests of North Virginia stretched out, their arms towards the sky. The night birds called to each other across the swamp at the foot of a rugged mountain. Here, in a gloomy cavern, the horned owl slept through the day. She was stirring now, and the doom of the brooding wildfowl was very near. As Conrad approached the cavern, the stillness was broken by an awful cry. Shrieking demons and roaring winds seemed to be part of it, and every separate hair of his smooth, dark head did its best to stand on end. War, a war, a war, 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 wailed the horn owl. And then came a series of horrible chucklings and fiendish laughter, nothing but the thought of his <coughs> father, and his longing to find the fair white merle would have taken Conrad towards those sands. All the ghost stories that he had ever read came back to his mind, and when the weird cry was repeated, he could have screamed. It was cheery little Gladheart who reassured him. I shouldn't have thought one bird could make so much noise, he twittered. And Conrad remembered a tale his father told him about some brave Highlanders who were camping out in the backwoods. They happened to come across an Indian tomb, and, being in a hurry, had used part of it for their fire instead of waiting to cut some wood. When the great horned owl began her midnight screeching, they thought that the spirits of the dead warriors had come to haunt them, and though they would have faced indifferently a powerful foe, they trembled like little children and covered their heads till dawn. I'm sure I'm not surprised, Conrad thought as he entered the cavern. If they heard sounds like these. The darkness was so black that he could almost feel it, and from its depths two eyes glowed at him like lurid fires. Nearer and nearer these came towards him. He stumbled backwards, and with hoots of rage the great horned owl drove him out before her. As she perched on a rocky crag beyond the cave, she rocked herself to and fro with goblin mirth. You are frightened, she hissed, and you're a boy. Conrad flushed to the roots of his hair. Of course I was frightened, he said resentfully. Who wouldn't be at a noise like that? But I came to find you all the same, uh, and Barney would be very much hurt if he knew you had hissed at me. Barney? I suppose you mean one of my cousins, the barn door owl, she remarked loftily. They are worthy creatures, and if, as your manner implies, a barn door owl has taken you under his protection, I will grant you an audience. Be seated, pray, and tell me what do you want. She listened attentively, staring at him solemnly with luminous eyes that seemed to look through his into some distant scene beyond, while Conrad repeated the oft-told story of the White Merle. When he had finished, she gave a strange, weird cry that was like a call. A rush of wind came down from the heights, and the pine trees on the mountains swayed their lofty crowns. Oh, foolish boy, she murmured and her shrill, harsh voice had grown quite gentle. You have sought afar what you might have found in your own land. In a country dale, in your little England, where bowers of roses and twining honeysuckle keep guard by a cottage door, a fair white merle has dwelt for many a day. She comforts her son with her son, a little child, whose mother left him the day he first saw her light. Conrad sprang to his feet with a cry of joy, and straight away unfurled his wings. "'How can I find this white merle?' he cried. "'Tell me, and I will thank you always.' The horned owl gave a derisive chuckle. "'You'll soon forget,' she said. "'It is the way with man. "'But I'll help you all the same, if you will do exactly what I tell you. "'You promise?' 
then time your arrival on English shores so that you reach them at the coming of a new moon. That night you must sleep under the shadow of a great hill. At break of day a swallow will greet you, and as the sun tips the clouds with amber, she will take you to the fair white mirror. Conrad would have started his journey home at once, but the owl reminded him that he must wait for the new moon. You may never return, she said, to this part of the world, and you must not go without seeing some of its wonders. Our most marvellous birds dwell in South America. It is a long journey, but there is magic abroad tonight, and the wind will help you. The pine trees swayed again in the moonlight, and as Conrad's wings bore him upwards, he was caught in a strong current of air. Almost without an effort, he skimmed along as quickly as the wind itself. Dawn came again, and moon and evening tide, but still he sped on, and when at last the southern continent was reached, he had lost all count of time. A deep, refreshing sleep, a splash in a crystal brook, a breakfast of sweet wild strawberries and golden honey, and Conrad was ready to explore again. The glowing heat, the exquisite flowers, the grandeur of the lofty forests made him almost fancy himself back in the Aru Islands. But the birds were different, though he thought them nearly as beautiful. He had never seen anything more radiant than the hummingbirds, who flashed in and out of the thick branches like points of light. As they hovered over the scented blossoms, the quick vibration of their wings made them almost invisible and their glittering bodies were then like gleaming jewels suspended in the air. The most wonderful of them all he found in a thicket of thorny bushes covered with starry flowers, the wire-like plumes that sprang from the tiny fellow, fellow's tail and crossed each other were decorated at their tips by the loveliest feather rackets of metallic luster. Further on, several racket-tailed hummingbirds were playing in an open space, where there were no flowers from which to steal the nectar. Facing each other and spreading their plumes, they would dart from side to side so quickly that Conrad's eyes could scarcely follow them. Either the quivering movement of their wings or the spreading of their glittering rackets made a curious little click, heard amidst the low humming from which they take their name. Conrad could not induce them to notice him, they were far too interested in their aerial game. But a less brilliant hen-bird, poised above some violet blossoms that were very small and sweet, stopped her clear cry of tsee, 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 to talk to him. She was very shy, this dainty little lady, but she forgot herself and grew quite at ease when speaking of her nest. It is all beautiful, she said swelling her tiny throat. We made it of soft green moss and trimmed it with delicate lichen. Some hummingbirds sew theirs to the tip of a palm leaf, or weave them in the shape of a cup and hide them behind the bough. Occasionally they are hung by the centre of the tendril of a vine, and if one side of the nest is heavier than the other and so will topple over and let the eggs fall out, they make things right by balancing the light aside with a little stone or a lump of earth. Our eggs are as white as pearls, and we never have room for more than two. While we are sitting, our mates sing love songs to us with their wings to while away the time. Their songs are sweet, and they pass the days quickly. How can they sing with their wings? demanded Comrade. But the little creature flashed past him to drink from the sparkling cascade of water that flowed from the mountainside, pretending that she had not heard him. He had wandered down to a river when he became aware of a most disagreeable smell, and found himself in the midst of a flock of birds almost as large as peacocks. Their heads were adorned with flowing crests of narrow feathers, and their plumage was a tasteful contrast of chestnut brown and white. Conrad guessed at once that these were the Hoatzin, birds so peculiar his father had once explained that no others like them were known to exist. 
They were thought to be the sole survivors of a great family that once spread over the earth and were sometimes called reptilian. But Conrad could not see anything so very strange about the Hoatzins. Though they gathered round him, he wished that they would not come quite so close. Their peculiar odour was rather overpowering. But he found them so remarkably intelligent that he decided to put up with this. As he sat on the bank amongst them, he could not resist the temptation to ask their leader in what way they resembled reptiles. He half expected a burst of indignation, but found him quite flattered instead. It is very remarkable, said the fine old bird. But we heard one night from a keen north wind that man has taken it into his head to say that all birds sprang from a sort of lizard. And one reason, I suppose, why they call us Hoadzins reptilian is because we have lizard-like claws on the side of our wings. If anything frightens our young ones when we are away, they crawl out of their nests, much as the lizards would, using their wing claws as if they were hands, climbing in this way from branch to branch. There's a fossil bird about the size of a crow in the British Museum, remarked Conrad, quite pleased to have some information to give which is very like a lizard, especially its tail. I went to see it in the holidays. It was called an, Archie, Archie, uh, an Archaeopteryx. Have a drink of water, said the Hoatzin with much solicitude. There, you'll feel better now. I wouldn't try to say such a word again. What bell is ringing? That is only the call of the bell bird. He is ever so far away at pleasant present, but his voice carries a long distance. A handsome white bird himself with a feathered horn upon his forehead, he has to put up with a mate dressed in dowdy green, and I am bound to say he is very fond of her. They call to each other for hours at a time, as you're here if you stay in the forest. It was in trying to find the owners of the clear sharp notes which rang out so persistently that Conrad came across a pair of oven birds, who, having been separated for a whole half hour, were expressing their joy at their reunion in a series of discordant cries. Three of these being uttered in quick succession as they faced each other with drooping wings and outstretched necks. They did not turn their heads until Conrad was close upon them, and then they stared at him defiantly. "'Will you show me your nest?' he said, going straight to the point. "'I think I remember hearing it was most extraordinary.' "'It is only one of its kind.' returned the cock, seizing a beetle in his pointed beak and crushing it with relish. If you promise not to touch, I don't mind letting you see it. What do you say, my dear? My dear was very proud to show their joint handiwork, and pointed out a large dome of mud which must have weighed some fifteen or sixteen pounds, and looked huge in comparison with its tiny architects. No attempt had been made to hide it. The oven-like structure was boldly perched on the fork of a leafless branch. The entrance was placed on one side, and the walls were over an inch in thickness. Beneath the dried mud, they told him, was a firm foundation of straw and stems of grass, supplies of which they took it in turns to fetch when they were nest building. Inside the entrance was the hall, or sitting room, a partition rising almost to the roof, cutting this off from the inner chamber. Here, on a bed of moss amidst downy feathers, pulled from her own breast, the hen could lay her eggs. 
Conrad thought this nest a wonderful production, and the oven, oven birds were gratified with his praise. We build a new one every year, said the hen, little hen brightly. I can't think why those mop moths are so lazy. Fancy just swooping out a hole in the river bank and laying your eggs at the end of it on a few dry sticks. Mop mop, mop mop, cried a brilliant bird decked in tints of scarlet and green and blue. He was sitting upon a perch that commanded a view of the forest path, swinging his tail like the pendulum of a clock, and never stirring a feather unless an insect came near him, when he launched himself through the air and caught it in his beak. Now he flew down beside Conrad, turning his back upon the oven, oven birds, as if they were not there. Our tunnels are much longer than you think, he said, and give us a great deal of trouble to make. See how I've trimmed my two centre tail feathers to form a racket. Isn't it lovely? What mop, what mop? This was all he would say. And as the oven birds were once more occupied in telling each other what charming creatures they were, Conrad took to his wings again. He passed over forests and mountains and velvet tablelands, over deep ravines that were full of shadows and marshy swamps that the moon had transformed with silver. He met wonderful birds on every side, but he was too homesick now to care to make friends with them. He longed for the hour when he might start for home. He took refuge one day from the heat of the sun under some spreading cedar trees that fringed the marshlands. It was the nesting place, he found, of the heron's cousins, the egrets. Large, slimly shaped birds with snow-white plumage and tender eyes the colour of an evening primrose. The delicate feathers that they wore only during the breeding season were at their loveliest now, and the pale blue eggs in the nests in the fragrant cedars had just been hatched into the quaintest and sweetest of downy nestlings. Conrad was touched to see the devotion with which their parents hurried to feed them, and the soft little sounds of delight with which the nestlings greeted them each time they came was music to his ears. No birds in the world were happier than they when he left them that tranquil evening, and he dropped off to sleep in a mountain cave where the deadly mists could not reach him. He was glad to think that they had no enemies to fear. When he awoke next morning he remembered that it was his last in America, so he went to pay them a farewell visit. The blue of the sky shone back from the pools on the marshes, and the cedars stood proud and stately in the golden light. But today strange sounds came from the spreading branches, no love notes from fond and tender mothers, but clamorous cries of hunger from starving nestlings, who could not understand the why they had been deserted. Rough feet had trodden the ground beneath the cedars, Draggled feathers were trampled into the oozing mud, and when Conrad would have approached the reeds, Gladheart hurried him away. Nothing we can do, he said. The hunters were here when daylight broke. The egrets were killed for the sake of their bridal feathers, and their nestlings were starved to death. Conrad shuddered as he remembered that kind Mrs. Blake in her Sunday bonnet wore one of the very same plumes. Thank you.